My name is Dave, and I'm here to talk about domain modeling with your product team. And uh, before we get started, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I come from Minnesota. I've lived there for about 25 years now. Been a developer for 18 of those 25 years, roughly. And uh, my role is a development manager, software architect, developer. I work at a small company, so play a lot of different roles. <clears throat> well, originally, I grew up in Wisconsin, so just a quick side note. Every time I come to Denver, this is the image that's in my mind. <laughs> Anybody uh, know where this is from? Hopefully, since this is Denver. OK. So yeah, I hear they play each other this weekend, so I'm hoping some revenge. Uh, you know, I'm always thinking about that day a long time ago. <laughs> Can't let it go. Um, so a little bit about the company I work for, Inbox Dollars, uh, just sort of to set the stage for the rest of the presentation. Uh, Inbox Dollars is an online rewards club. Uh, they've been around since 2004. And it's a website you can sign up for. Uh, once you're a member, you can earn money um, by taking surveys, playing games, and uh, we have three sister sort of sites, uh, one in the UK, one in um, Canada. And there's many sites similar to it, but it's a very complex uh, business, a lot of crazy logic. So why are we here today? Uh, why am I here today? And why is uh, modeling your domain with your product team important? Uh, first of all, I think code health as a software developer is very important to me and my team. Um, we want to have simple solutions, a smaller footprint, and not have a lot of code debt. Engagement is also important. Uh, company culture at Inbox Dollars is a huge priority. So you want to keep developers happy. So you don't want to build features that you know, are kind of hacked in there and you want to have a good connection with your product team. We want to retain our employees and you know, not lose people because they're frustrated. Without our members, the website would not exist, obviously. And using domain-driven design principles and concepts, as I'm going to talk about in a little bit here, will help bring better value to our members. So I've worked at four or five different companies, and there's always this competing nature of these two things. Software architecture is on one side. You have the developers. They want to write good code, stuff that's easy to maintain. On the other side, you have the product team. They want to get features out as fast as possible. And you know, there's a competing nature. It's a conflict in some of the places I've worked with. Anybody here deal with this? Okay, good. Well, hopefully, during this talk, I'll give you some takeaways, um, and I'm going to focus on how you can apply DDD concepts and open that up, not just to the development team, but with your product team. <clears throat> at a high level, uh, this is how we build things at Inbox Dollars. You know, initially, there's an idea. And this is before, uh, the next few slides is all before we introduced any DDD uh, principles. So there's an idea. Someone at the company submits an idea, or we hear something from one of our members, and then the feature is discussed, this new idea, usually just with the, within the product team. And they go over you know, the normal things. Does this fit our quarterly goals? Do we have the resources to do this? Is it a fit? Uh, following that, uh, every Friday, we would have these sprint planning meetings where the development managers and the CTO and the product team sits down and just kind of allocates what everyone's going to work on next. After that, uh, we decide what we're going to do in the next week or two. So the product team would submit their stories, and we have our own sort of internal system called Tracker. And you know they put in the requirements, assign it to the developer, quickly followed up 
you know, they usually, it's a small office, they'll walk over and talk to the developer one-on-one. -on -one. You know, here's what we want to do, here's what we want to get out of this. You got any questions? You know, usually our developers have some questions. Shortly after that, they would uh, just start working. And, you know, at some point, they would be done working and do a code review. Next up is just QA, product team tests it, signs off, and then you mark it as ready to roll, goes to production, and the feature is in a split test mode. You know, if it's a new feature and we want to test it, uh, we also always have a feature switch. And once it's in production is usually when we start to optimize it or if we need to. So then we're done, right? Everything's perfect. Anyone see any problems with this so far? No feedback loop. Very good point. Anything else? Go ahead. Too late in the process. Good point. Um, so as I said before, it's a small office. So a lot of times you could see this from a developer. You know, a lot of frustration because they're doing a lot of siloed development, you know, the, the meetings occur with just the product team to talk about the new feature. Then they just assign it to the developer and the product manager just talks one-on-one -on -one with the developer. So let's talk more about the frustrations and focus in on what happens when the developer starts to develop and build the new feature. So basically, you know, they start development start coding, maybe make a little bit of progress. And then, of course, within a day or two, they're blocked. Um, they need some feedback. Or the product manager is unfamiliar with this part of the app or not super familiar. So the uh, developer has to jump through way too many hoops to fulfill this uh, feature request. So then they reach out to the product owner who provides feedback, or they have to uh, seek out the stakeholder. And a lot of times, the you know product managers are in a lot of meetings, so there's delay and there's an interruption. After that, you know if the if the product owner can't clarify the questions the developer has and get them unblocked. You have to reach out to the stakeholder. More delay, more interruptions. You know, the developer is idle or they've switched to a different project. And as speaking as a developer, switching and starting and doing all that is not good for progress. But let's say the, devel the developer gets the feedback they need from the stakeholder. They start working again. OK, let's get this done. So at a certain point, the developer has made some progress. Maybe they kind of have it working, but now they're not sure exactly what's the best approach in the actual code. Um, you know, we want to have healthy code. We don't want to make our code worse. And they also might discover you know, they're further along. They might find something missing in the requirements uh, that they need more clarification on. An example being you know, at Inbox Dollars, we partner with a lot of different APIs, and sometimes that client could block one of our members for many reasons, and that would cause you know, the API return to change, and the product manager might not have thought of that, so then you have to reach out again, get more feedback, more meetings, and developers don't really like meetings. So again, we're idle. And they reach out to the software architect to try to get some advice on the best approach. Um, maybe the architect can provide examples. And at Inbox Dollars, we don't really have a defined role for an architect. We just have senior developers that are just subject matter experts. But they would have examples. Uh, but again, this is more delayed. Uh, the senior developer is getting interrupted, um, kind of unscheduled interruption. 
Meanwhile, you know, it's a small office. Let's say the system architect hears these two developers talking about something. They're like, wait a minute. What you're going to do is going to cause a lot of problems with our Redis uh, server farm or the SQL database is going to blow up or whatever you're trying to call. You're trying to call this API. It's going to slow down page load. So now we've got to add a whole other component to this project that was not even considered at the beginning. So then eventually we sort things out. You know, scope has increased, but the developer is back in business, feeling good. And let's say now they've got it kind of working, but then they get blocked again because there was nobody that told them like how we're going to measure this. How is the BI team going to report on the success or failure of this feature? Another time where the developer is interrupted and blocked. So they get the feedback. BI team tells them, OK, you can do it this way. We're good. And then, of course, finally, we launch it. At the end of this whole process, you know, all the stops and starts, switching, you see this from developers like, oh my gosh. I don't know if I really like working here. This is just too frustrating. You know, I'm working on this project for a day, and then I'm waiting on something, and then I'm starting a new project. You know, it's just mayhem. So after a couple of years of experiencing this, working at Inbox Dollars, we started to make some change and realized, you know, we had to evolve as a team. Uh, at Inbox Dollars, the code has been around for a long time, and a lot of the team members have been around for over eight years. <clears throat> so they've always been kind of doing things a certain way. But as a group, we all kind of agreed, like, let's try some new stuff. And at one point, a couple of product managers went to South by Southwest conference, and they came back all fired up about what Netflix was doing. And we got to be more like Netflix, so we're going to fail fast and do all these quick solutions. And, you know, like three or four years ago, I learned about domain-driven design. So I started to introduce that. And in December, we had our first release as far as, you know, the concepts. But it was really just part of the development team. It wasn't a shared thing. <clears throat> and we kept evolving. We kept, you know, talking to each other. And fortunately, we all, everybody, stayed, you know, we didn't have turnover or anything like that. And most importantly, I will say after this whole process, uh, you know, this has been five year ev evolution. The most important thing that we did was we made a development team mission. And that was in 2017, where the director of development, she brought us all into a room and we brainstormed and we said, what are we about? Why are we here? You know, we've got all this crazy legacy code, how are we going to get this better? And we set standards. You know, we decided that we always want to improve and learn new things. <clears throat> and we kind of set out a plan, and we've been doing that at the beginning of every year since then. And we set these like big goals, you know, four or five things that we want to accomplish and check those off every quarter. And then uh, we started being more of an agile team, middle of May 2017. Then we moved. Uh, another important step was we acknowledged that we are a software company. So for all these years, uh, they were just writing new features. You know, the leadership team just wanted to, you know, increase the amount of members we have on our site, and they didn't think about you know that we're writing software. So at one point, the director of development and the rest of the team, we all made a code manifesto. And we had the leadership team read it and actually sign off on it. And that changed a lot of things, because it, it acknowledging you know, that that was part of the company, embedded in the company, that we're a software company, makes other things more you know, possible. <clears throat> and I'll talk more in a second about you know, some of these other things. Uh, as far as design sprints, uh, when we started event storming, and you know these are all within the last year and a half, two years. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to get into 
what principles we applied and how we did it. Uh, the first thing we did when we knew we were going to work on something, we created a kickoff session before any development was started. And there would be all the stakeholders in this meeting. And it's you know a long meeting, depending on the feature. But it was very important to have before any development started. And this would be you know the developer that was working on it. And a lot of times, you know, that was a new concept because we didn't even have developers in some of these early brainstorming sessions. And we bring in the stakeholder, you know, who requested it, usually it's just one person. And of course, product owner is running the meeting. And architects can give their input. And you have a business analyst there, all working together. And then you start the meeting. And the beginning of the meeting, just state the business purpose. OK, why are we here? Why are we building this? Quantify it. Um, this is sort of just an introduction to the meeting to try to get you know, a, a baseline of why we're all here and agree we're all here for the same reason, um, that we're trying to make things better for our members. And you know, we talk about what it is that we're doing, uh, any open questions, and then we decide sort of the next steps. <clears throat> and in uh, most of our features are based off you know, time and how long you've been a member to the site, um, a lot of complicated business rules. Um, so we would, more often than not, have an event storming session as part of this kickoff meeting. We would also decide at the beginning of the meeting what the next steps after the kickoff meeting would be. Do we want to do a design sprint? And that usually uh, is a good thing to do for a feature that is, you know, we're iterating off an existing feature. And then the MVP is best suited for a new feature that we don't really know if this is going to work. Um, it's just an idea. You know, what can we do to prove its value? <clears throat> so event storming, as I stated before in our timeline, uh, pretty new to the company. And it kind of just evolved from you know, me going to conferences and learning about event storming. And when I tried it the first time, it was a huge failure. Um, I you know, just kind of set it up, didn't give any introduction to what it was, and I just kind of thought that people would think this is a cool idea. Problem was is I didn't define the scope. It was too broad, um, too, we got tangents all over the place and it was just not a good fit. Um, so I quickly realized that these sessions for at least at inbox dollars, it needed to be customized depending on who the audience was. Is it you know, a senior manager? Is it a tech, technical team? Um, have, have anyone on this uh, session done this before? Uh, you know, the, is the feature a brand new feature? All of that changed the setup in the uh, event storming session. And I always allow twice as much time than you think is needed. And sort of the way that we did it during these kickoff sessions is to have a sort of high level event storming session. And that brings everybody into the, you know, the scope of work and what the events are for this new feature. After that, I got a lot of value by doing these separate uh, deep dive sessions with the tech team. Uh, for example, we have a lot of backend processes that look at partner uh, APIs. A lot of that is prone to failure. And there's a ton of messages and events happening all the time. How do you measure that and properly log it to the right people when things go wrong? So those sessions were really valuable. And we also had sessions where that might not even be a developer in it. It could just be a separate dive into one aspect of the feature. Might just be a designer and a product manager and the stakeholder. So here's a representation of the high level event storming session. 
you know, I said the first time we did this, it was kind of a failure, but the, one of the biggest things that everybody realized was how many events occur on our site, let's say for a member that is just trying to take surveys. There's a ton of things that happen that are quickly exposed when you do a session like this. <clears throat> so I, I realized there was a lot of value in just parsing it off, not trying to chunk off you know, this whole survey system that we had built, parsing it off into one section. Um, and that allowed a lot more focus and a lot more room to like soak it in. And I also learned that a lot of senior leadership people, it's hard to get them out of their chair to like come up and put post-it notes. So for a while, I was doing it for them. But I'm like, OK, it's OK. You could come up. You know, in another session, I would remove the chairs you know, if there was executives or something in there. Uh, that helped a lot. So after we would do these event storming sessions, and this is still all in this kickoff meeting, and sometimes these meetings can go the whole afternoon. Uh, usually, we'll bring in lunch just to keep people motivated. Then we would talk about, OK, we've done all these events. What's our model? And I think this was a big change, because before, the developers would talk about the modeling and all that. you know, But bringing it in and letting the product team share that ownership helped a lot. And it didn't need to be super detailed. It could just be a sketch on a whiteboard. <clears throat> and then towards the end, when you're looking at the domain model, we talk about language. And that was the biggest change, um, working with the product team and agreeing on things up front before the development started. I can't tell you how many times I've gone back and tried to remember what this feature meant because later on, you know. We started the development early because we got to get things done, right? And this is years ago. We started it before we even knew what to call it. Um, so two years later, you're like, OK, I got to remember you know, this actually means this to everybody else at the company. Or if you have like a new developer come in, you know, they're clueless. Trying to remember all these things, it's just hard to keep that all in your brain. So it's consistent. Naming conventions are huge. And to share that and everybody be in this room together, you remind, remember we've got all the stakeholders, the business analysts, and the system architects, and the product owner all talking the same language and realizing, OK, these are the terms. And going back to the original event storming session, um, a big change was just the naming things. Half the company was calling something uh, the greater, you know, which we use to score all of our uh, surveys so like our members get the best surveys. So if you notice there, I call things two different things right there. Uh, so all over our code, it was inconsistent um, naming conventions, which is just confusing for people that are new to the company or people that have, haven't worked on this part of the domain. So the nuance really matters. And all of those specifics. Did you have a question? Oh, OK. Feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, so anyways, you know, we would agree on the model, identify any, what the contacts are, and move on from that into the final part of the kickoff meeting of what are the deliverables. <clears throat> So yes, we did this awesome event storming. How do you capture that? Especially if the developer isn't going to start working on this you know, for a couple days. They might forget a couple of the details. Or somebody might take off all the Post-it notes because they need to do another session, or you know, they're just cleaning up the room. So having that all translating and having a standard way of doing it was critical. And also part of this uh, meet, end of this part of the meeting we would decide who's going to work on it, how many people are involved, try to guess how much time it might take. And then in the uh, part of the deliverable, this all goes into the epic. What's the revenue that's expected from this?
Another thing that we started a couple years ago was the design sprint. Anyone familiar with this? I know it's more for product people, but uh, we had a new product manager come in with this, and his last job, he had been doing this. That was just their normal process every week. Um, so it's a way to be more creative in your product design. And you basically isolate a small team. You pick you know, a developer, a mixed role team, a developer, designer, product manager, could be you know, a salesperson. And you put them all in a conference room for a week. And at the beginning, at the onset, you kind of set, OK, this is the part of the application that we're going to look at. And at the end of the presentation, I have a link if anybody is interested. So the design sprint is a very methodical approach. There's actual like checklists for every day, and each color on here represents a day. Beginning of the process is just mapping out uh, what you want to do, what are your goals, and you know this is all on uh, in our one of our conference rooms. There's just windows all around, so we put sticky notes all over the place, and you bring in experts. Um, for the one uh, example that I'm going to talk about a little bit here, we brought in some of our member services team that has to deal with member complaints. What are you hearing from the members about this particular feature? And then at the end of the first day, you pick your target. What's the greatest opportunity? Second day, you come in, and people are, you know, the people in this group are supposed to do some little research the night before, and you sketch it out and you demo what the competitors are doing that's kind of similar to this feature. And then you go through sketches, and you're using big Sharpie markers, because you, you don't want people to try to detail it out, especially if you have a designer in your room. Um, and at the end of that day, you know, it's a long day, you have uh, sketches from each <coughs> member of the team. And this is just a photo I took from the one we did in the winter. You can see the snow in the background. So the majority of the time, you're not even sitting at a computer. You're just talking amongst yourselves, talking, you know, looking at the whiteboard, looking at the notes. Uh, all the people we interviewed on Monday, you know, you take little post-it notes, put those all over, and then you kind of organize it, group it. So the third day, you come in, and that's when you decide on what you're going to do. And basically, you put all the st the uh, sketches that we did the day before on the whiteboard, and people vote on what they like the best. And at the end of the third day is when you decide, you know, okay, this is what we're going to do, and we storyboard it out. And this is where you get a little bit more detailed. Uh, you know, these are the actions that happen with this new feature. And so this was the example um, from the pictures before. We have a part of our site where we try to get people to come back, um, and we try to pay people, reward people for doing things on our site that we really can't, you know, give you a dollar for, because it's just we're going to lose money on that. Uh, but let's say you're playing games on our site. The longer you play the games, you earn progress on your scratch bar at the top here. You can see the bar going across, and then you get a scratch-off card, and you can potentially win, you know. Depending on which level you reach, you can win different amounts of uh, cash. And this was a really good feature that allowed us to do a lot of other things. Before we had this feature, we couldn't do games. Um, it's just, you know, the net revenue was just not there. But once we introduced this, it was kind of a fun experience for members. We got a lot of good feedback. After a while, a lot of our regular members started to complain, you know, this is just becoming boring. And we're not really, this isn't as exciting. And they kind of figured out also the patterns that we had. So the focus of this design sprint became this feature, how to make it more sticky. Um, so we decided on that feature, what we were going to do. We storyboarded it out. And this is when I introduced the event storming session. 
because it's just a great transition before you start writing any code to identify all the new events that you've uh, introduced with this new feature and also um, put all the events that are already there, you know, for this, for this example, for the scratch off, all these things that happen in the back end, front end, um, and put that all out there. So this is the same room. You know, we've just added another session, uh, event storming session. Um, so it was kind of cool to go through this week where you've got all this stuff in the same room, and it was really good to like keep things moving and to motivate people to um, just keep moving with this feature. And I kind of coined the term event superstorm because it kind of combines the things. Uh, couldn't come up with a better name, but anyways. Uh, so after you identify all the events and you try to isolate the core domain, it's a shared experience the whole week. Um, then the fourth day, and basically, since I've added the event storming, it looks like six days, but I combine the third and fourth day. You prototype, and this is where you're sitting at the computer and you sketch it out. And we have an online tool that we use called it. Uh, it's an Adobe product. So then we actually send out this new uh, feature to our members, and we select you know, a group of members and just send out a survey monkey with this link, and they can click through. It's an interactive mock-up. So it's basically a prototype. And then we can get real-time feedback overnight. Uh, so then the next day, the last day, we can analyze all those results. And we also posted this on our Facebook page uh, with questions like, why is this important? How does this help? And we tried to figure out why people we're coming back and using this feature. And this was the feature we came up with, the iteration on the scratch off. So basically, you can go through different days. And the goal, you know, what we want to get out of this is getting people more engaged, using our app more often, and coming back every day. So basically, every third day, you get a bonus scratch off card that pays out a little bit more. So that's the design sprint. And basically, it, the use case is really good for a feature that you already have. Maybe you want to iterate and make it better. Or maybe it didn't perform that well, with, and you want to like have a more creative process. And introducing the event storming also makes the prototype better. And then the last day is kind of the cool day as a developer, because you actually merge something to our master branch and get ready to roll that to production. <clears throat> when we have a new feature that we're not sure about, uh, that's when we go through this MVP process. Anyone do this? How many people love doing this? Cool. Not as many hands. Um, so uh, just as. Just a famous quote from Truman, you know, basically when they were about to invade Normandy, all the commanders were talking about how do we get everything aligned up perfectly, all these things. And the Germans were trying to figure out what they were doing. And you know, I've read some things where maybe this wasn't said by him, but basically the point is that imperfect action beats perfect action. Or, sorry, imperfect action beats perfect inaction every time. And it's a Wayne Gretzky quote. So basically, we would start a fail fast process. And, you know, basically, you just highlight what's the simplest thing you can do or we can do as a company at Inbox Dollars to prove this hypothesis. Um, and how will it affect the current domain? Um, so when we first started doing MVP, there was no DDD concepts discussed. It was just like, okay, how can we get this out there? What's the easiest way? Um, and a lot of times we'd talk about how can we do this without making any code changes? Uh, the, it, the app has been around for 15 years, so there are a lot of things that we can do with a mature app like that that don't require any code changes. 
So as an example, we had a hypothesis that we wanted to do uh, online trivia. And it was to get people to come back. Uh, that was one of the struggles we had a few years ago as to how to retain members and keep them coming back and engaged. So we had an idea, like, what if we had just a trivia every day and we paid our members you know, a couple cents uh, for answering these questions? And then we would give them the results of that. Sort of like a fun thing to do. Now, we didn't have this feature on our site. And a lot of the team was unsure if this was a good idea. We had tried different things before. So instead of going and writing code and you know, the developer just going off on his own and spending three weeks and then this idea is just a failure, uh, we decided we figured out a way to test the hypothesis by just emailing a group of members, 20,000, I think we picked like 20,000 members, new members to our site. And half of them got an email three days in a row that just said, click on this email and you will get one cent. And so that was just for the first three days of the, the new member's life. Um, after that, it was just the same experience. And then what we found, you know, so we analyzed the data after like 30 days. And again, this is with no code. Uh, we found that those members that got those emails the first three days stayed around longer with the app. So then we're like, OK, this is a good idea. And it turned out to be one of the best uh, solutions we've had to retain members. Um, people post and talk about these questions on our Facebook page. Um, they'll nail you right away if we put the wrong answer in there. Uh, I think the product team owns this, and they have made a mistake a couple times where they put the wrong answer in. So it was a huge success. Um, the problem was, with MVP style development, you know, the developers don't really like it. And going back to the beginning of my talk, um, we want to keep developers retained. We want to keep them working at inbox dollars. We want to keep them happy. Writing code that's just kind of hacked in there, uh, the application is an MVC application. So you, if you're telling someone, OK, you got to do this in a couple days, there's going to be bits and pieces of that code all over. And what are you going to do if that uh, feature, this new thing you're trying out, fails? Someone's got to delete that code. Uh, but more often than not, we'd just forget about it. And then you just have all this crap sitting around in your application that is just lurking. Um, or someone doesn't want to go back and take the chance of breaking something. So what we uh, adapted you know, using more DDD approach was to request from the product team that whatever MVP we're going to do, it needs to be isolated in our application. Um, and we just wouldn't do it if that wouldn't work. Um, so we would isolate the feature into a service and identify a quick model and show it to the product team and make sure they agree that this is the right approach. So that way, the code can easily be deleted. And then on the other side, if the feature succeeds, you already have this isolated code that you can like go back and you know, apply the right standards that we want uh, as a team. So wrapping up, um, I think we've created a symbiosis with the software architecture and the product design uh, using these three approaches. You know, I've seen it. I've seen people be a lot happier, at least <laughs> my opinion. You know, I think we've retained employees. Our developers are still around. And we've had better success, less bugs put into production by using these principles. You know, surrounding DDD. So, just summing up, um, I really agree that moving fast can be the bad approach. You know, you come to one of these conferences or you read about DDD and you're like, oh, this is so awesome. We got to do everything like this. Um, you get a lot of pushback if you try that. And it took a while at my company to kind of establish 
using the domain modeling and the principles of DDD. And like I've talked about, I think customizing everything to your team and your company is really important. And you know, event storming has worked. It took me, and if you're starting this new at your company, it might take you a few tries. Don't give up. Uh, I almost did, <laughs> um, but it works. And you, as long as you cater it to the audience and you adjust, you know, you can't just p apply one standard event storming to people that are non-technical. You have to cater it to that audience. And that's it. Any questions? Sorry, I think they get. Up front. Yeah, what, if any, concerns did you have to address as you were introducing uh, with members of your team or members of your company as you were introducing DDD and the processes associated with DDD? And how did you address them? What concerns yeah, I had? What if any, no, what, if any, concerns did you have to address cause, um, with other people as you were championing this, this approach? Um, so one of the biggest concerns was the, you know, some people would learn that I was starting to incorporate this in the code. Other developers would be like, oh, that's just crazy. You know, they'd go online and read something about all these different, you know, all the extra stuff. And I think the biggest concern that I alleviated was that you don't have to do it according to the book. There's like, a thousand ways you can do it. I think the ma biggest thing is to work with the rest of the company. You know, the technical issue is sort of up to the developer and the standards that we've agreed upon. Um, but they don't have to like implement DDD. You know, you don't have to have the domain model and you know repository pattern or anything like that. I think it was mostly alleviating that helped a lot because then they would start agreeing with some of the event storming. Um, you know, having this shared language, all of that is the benefit that I've seen. Sure. Um, so at the end of your design sprint, when you, once you get the feedback from your, your test users, uh, what happens when, when you're off? Do you like go back and keep designing, like redo your design sprint to fix it? Yeah, um, and so like the third day, or I think it's the fourth day when you share the prototype, we would adjust and just change it. Um, and we hadn't written any code. This was just a mock-up. So we would tweak it according to the feedback we got from our members. And we'd also bring in other people in the company to kind of give us feedback. And then at the end of that sprint, you know, usually you would write a small feature, small part of that feature, and roll that out. got time. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Um, so how did you get your corporate stakeholders to come to your event storming sessions? Did you get any problems with that? Uh, yeah, there was a lot of questioning, like, why are we here? Um, this is a waste of my time. Um, but I think I brought them in, brought them lunch. <coughs> that was big. Um, and then breaking it off and identifying just small pieces made it where people would dive into it more, especially if it was something that we were building that was new or an existing a change to something that already existed. Um, the initial meeting that I had that was a failure, I was just going over something that already existed. And the whole time I kept getting asked like, what are we gonna do after this? What's the purpose? Um, so I think identifying the purpose of the event storming session and the value that you can get out of it helped a lot, like focusing it in. One more question. Yeah, uh, last question. Do you have any resources you, you would suggest for learning more about event storming? Well, there's a lot of people here talking about it and over there. Um, I kind of learned just by going to conferences and actually doing it. You know, just even if it has nothing to do with the place you work, um, really gives you like the learning. It's pretty easy to pick up once you, you know what the colors are and things like that. Well, uh, thank you very much. Give her a round. Thanks. Thank you.